AC, uh, we are about done with Son of Hammerland 2022. We got one more month to go, but before that, we're going to talk about the November film, Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde, directed by Roy Ward Baker, who he, we've talked about a number of his films on, mm-hmm. on Hammerland and Son, Son of Hammerland. I didn't realize until looking up his filmography just before he jumped on that this is the third movie in three years, the third spectacular movie in three years that we've discussed. Um, yep. He did... Was it The Vampire Lovers and Scars of Dracula in 1970? He did this in 1971. And then in 1974, he did uh, The Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires. And he also made like three other movies in yeah. between there. <laughs> yeah, he's he's a workman. And and it, like uh, I listened to the commentary when we were getting ready to talk about this this film. And yeah, he it's, it's so funny because he's so just kind of down to earth. And he just, you know, it's just a... It, it's not that it's just a job, but it's like he doesn't think he's creating high art. He's just like, yeah, I go, I get up, I go to work, I do my thing, I go back home, I do the best I can. And everybody around him is like going, yeah, well, your Titanic film is the best Titanic film. James Cameron's, you know, he doesn't know what he's doing because um, he did A Night to Remember, which is like, you know, they were talking about the length of some of those films and the fact that, you know, his Night to Remember is two hours and he's like, I don't know. I was like, I just felt like it was getting long. <laughs> and then you got, you know, James Cameron, who's like, you know, three and a half hours later. Well, and that's the, I mean, that's the thing is like these, as I mentioned, these are, you know, pretty spectacular uh, movies. And it reminds me, what you're talking about reminds me of kind of William Shatner, where people, he's shared this anecdote a few times. People come up and ask him all this minutia about Star Trek. And he's like, mm. I, it was a job I did 50 years ago. It was great fun, but I don't know, you know, the difference between a tricorder and a nacelle. So I'm nope, the wrong yep. guy. You but know it better. Yeah. You know it better than I at this point. It, but it's amazing that people, you know, who we would hope would be as invested in making this art that we so appreciate, yeah. you know, would be share our level of enthusiasm, but there is something to be said for just going to work, doing the best job you can, and then kind of letting history tell the rest of the tale. Right. I think that's the case here. I'll confess. I've never read Robert Louis Stevenson's uh, n- uh, novel. Uh, there's a strange case of Mr. Hyde or whatever. Um, I kind of want to, after watching this film, doing some light wicking afterwards, it looks like there's a yeah, considerable difference in addition to the fact that instead of switching into like this garish monster creature, you know, the main character is transforming into a, a evil woman. Um, but also this has a lot more to do with the kind of the Jack the Ripper murders, which, you know, as history went on, people started drawing connections between Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and uh, and Jack the Ripper's killings, which happened, I guess, within a few years of each other. But mm-hmm. This is a strange, it's one of those frustrating movies that I absolutely love, but I feel like I don't know that I can recommend people because of the freaking title. Like you have to watch Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde. It just sounds like a bad 80s comedy. Well, what's funny about that is that it was, it came up, uh, they were in the, they were in a commissary and uh, they were talking about like, what's Dracula going to do next? You know, like it was, because it was this perpetual you know, like, how are we going to bring him back? What's he going to do, even though it's the same damn thing? Uh, and they were talking about, you know, various jokes on uh, Hammer franchises. And somebody said, what about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde? Because they had already done a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde called The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll. Or no, sorry, The Two Faces of Dr. Jekyll. Hmm. And uh, Brian Clemens, who ended up writing the screenplay, he said, wait a minute, I got it. Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde. And everybody laughed and thought that was funny. And then he said, no, no, I think I'm going to, and he went over to James Carreras's table and said, I've got your next movie for you. And James Carreras said, it was a Monday. And James Carreras said, come by my office on Thursday. And so Brian Clemens goes in on Thursday, prepared to pitch his film. And he's met at the door with a poster already made up of this movie, Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde. So, I mean, like uh, James Carreras recognized the value in the exploitation of it. And also since we were moving into the seventies, 
he saw that, hey, we could sex this up a little. You know, we can have uh, some nudity. And and uh, and so, yeah, it was it was a very easy sell. And then because Brian Clemens, uh, Roy Ward Baker had been part of the team that produced Vampire Lovers, which was kind of an outside uh, organization that brought the project to Hammer. And it was a similar situation here where Brian Clemens, you know, wrote the screenplay and it all kind of like operated under the Hammer umbrella, but it wasn't, you know, like it wasn't from within. However, Hammer had a few things to say, like they, they recommended Ralph Bates uh, to play the lead because at that point he'd done, I think, three films already for Hammer. It was definitely being groomed to kind of like be the the new Peter Cushing. Uh, Martine Beswick had done uh, One Million Years B.C. She was the the raven haired cave girl. And, uh, and then, you know, the, the rest of it kind of came together from there. And I'm glad it did. Um, this is, it's a very odd movie in that it's a fun film to watch. I mean, you've got mm -hmm. some kind of cheeky, you know, characters. There's definitely kind of really black comedy in there, but it is also, I think a quite cool fitting standalone bit of, you know, science fiction, um, mm -hmm. historical fiction. I mean, they've got Burke and Hare in there right. as characters, uh, you know, operating in the the kind of the London uh, underground with, you know, trafficking and body parts. And they run into a guy who's trying to figure out the secrets to immortality and he needs body parts. Yep. Um, and I love that, you know, they are sort of a stepping stone in his journey. And when the mob finds out that they've been grave robbing, like I, I don't know much about the Burke and Hare story, uh, so I'm not sure how accurate their demise, their respective demises are as depicted in this movie, but they're, you know, kind of horrifying. Um, and they're just sort of the movie disposes of them in this horrific manner. But, you know, you kind of when you see them introduced when I did, I thought they were going to be a main component of the story somehow, mm -hmm. but it's not. It's just one of the many ways in which this kind of plays with with my expectations, certainly. Well, and and what's fun is that it is kind of like uh, uh, I don't love this movie Van Helsing, but I like how like it incorporates different elements, and so that they all exist in the same universe. You know, so like we got Jack the Ripper, we have you know uh, Doctor Jekyll, Mister Hyde, and we have Burke and Hare. None of which were all in the same place at the same. I mean, like Burke and Hare operated out of Scotland; they were near Edinburgh, and Jack the Ripper, of course, was in Whitechapel. And, you know, the the uh, strange case of Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde operates all through London. So, you know, like the fact that he was able to kind of thread all these together, I just I think that's great. And Brian Clemens, you know, he'd already kind of had quite a success with his Avengers TV show uh, with Steed and, and Emma Peel. And one of the things that he talked about was that we always played it straight, but the characters had a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true here. It's like the characters are are human beings who have a sense of humor, but the situation they're dealing with is serious. It, it's a you know grave importance to them. Pardon, yeah, the, pardon I mean, the pun there. <laughs> well, a perfect example of that, I think, is um, was it Professor Robertson, who mm. is sort of a colleague, you know, maybe a mentor to to Doctor Jekyll, uh, who we meet early on, and he's established as this kind of womanizing horn dog. Yeah. And he is, it is kind of a jokey character, particularly I think it's his introduction where there's sort of these double entendre between him and, and Dr. Jekyll. And you're like, okay, I know where this is going, but no, he, he is a serious character who's got some serious character flaws mm -hmm. and he ends up hot on the trail of this killer who he doesn't know is one of his dear friends. And you sort of that that element of you know the the womanizing kind of drops out of the picture for a while but then comes back for his demise and you're like <laughs> oh that's right that's how he met this character that's how he would be so kind of yeah. easily seduced into going to this strange woman's or having this woman back to his apartment yeah. um it's yeah i didn't expect this many layers i mean hell we could talk about Ralph, the magnificent ralph bates playing a true tragic character he's a good guy who started off as a you know a scientist trying to essentially cure a whole slew full of a uh, slew of illnesses mm -hmm. and coming to realize that it would take 
a long time in order to do that. So he tries to unlock the secrets of you know eternal youth or at least you know vibrance so he could prolong his research so he could help mankind. That is right. explicitly what he wants to do, but he gets caught up in what he needs to do to achieve that. And that takes him down this dark road to the point where when he unleashes his id through this chemical mixture that he makes up, the id takes over. It's you know, this attractive kind of femme fatale version of himself that he's not fully aware of. Mm -hmm. Man, I mean, we could talk for probably three hours about everything that's going on in this character's head. <laughs> yeah. Well, we came close to synopsizing there. So I'm just going to finish in that. I mean, what happens is that Dr. Jekyll um, comes upon, you know, he creates this serum in that that is extent, intended to extend life. And he has like a little a little fly that's in the bell jar and this fly is supposed to have a lifespan of you know like just a few hours and turns out that the fly is living you know like days and one of the side effects of uh that prolonged life is that it changes sex it changes from male to female uh, as evidenced by the fact that it's laying eggs now and I think there's something kind of fascinating about that. I mean, there's something cliche about it as well. You know, like, oh, well, women, you know, are they have the silken skin and they keep their hair. So clearly they're they live. I'm like, well, women don't actually historically live longer than men. Um, well, not not to the extent that you know, <laughs> not hundreds of years. Right? Exactly. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> well, if you're a man too bad, you're going to die. But uh, women, they'll go on for at least three, three, three times as long. Well, uh, but and it's and and it's from there that and he has uh, Dr. Jekyll has that whole moral debate of, you know, do the ends justify the means? He has the thing of like, if you could save a ship liner filled with 500 passengers, but it meant that the lifeboat filled with six passengers had to die, would you make that choice? And, you know, he's helped along by his upstairs, his pretty upstairs neighbor, who's like, no, of course you have to do, you have to save the, 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 you know, the for the greater good. And he's like, awesome. And then he basically turns into Jack the Ripper. So um, what's it? And this is what's so frustrating is like looking up the, the credits here, the lovely Susan. What yes. was her? Who played her? Okay. Susan Spencer is played by oh, Susan Broderick, yep. um, who, who's, you know, just great and, and beautiful and, and a wonderful kind of romantic sort of foil uh, for Dr. Jekyll. But yeah, I, I love the fact that she kind of gives him the permission to do these horrible things. Completely um, unintentional. Right. But I like to think if we're talking about universes like story universes that all kind of tie together, mm -hmm. um, I like to think the the fly in the bell jar did live for several hundred years and ended up inside Jeff Goldblum's apartment, yes. jumping into go. the pod. <laughs> yep. So now it's 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 a it's an eternal brundle brundle fly. Yes. Oh, <gasps> Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Fly. There you go. Um but no, so th once he gets the uh, once Jekyll gets the idea of well, I can I can make this work, he turns to Burke and Hare and a shady uh, undertaker to get you know fresh body parts, and then when Burke and Hare, do, I'm I'm trying to make I'm, I'm trying to there's a lot of again different layers and and beats to this story, so I'm trying to keep mm -hmm. them straight. But Burke and Hare end up getting uh, taken down by the mob who realize you know what they're doing uh, to their dead. After Burke and Hare are dead, um, Dr. Jekyll decides... Hang on, decides, hang on, hang on. Hmm. Now, Burke, only Burke dies. I Hare, thought Hare... Hare... Hare gets thrown in the lime pit, and he becomes yeah. our blind beggar. That was him? That's him. That's him. And what's funny is I had not picked up on that until this viewing as well. Oh he, my God. He's our blind beggar. He loses his sight in the lime pit. And you remember the prostitute says, you know, he won't be able to see after they throw him into the lime. You'll be able to see him, but he won't be able to see you. So he's <laughs> blinded by the lime and he becomes, he becomes kind of that, uh, that blind beggar who's, who's tapping around for the rest of the movie. And this is, thanks for bringing that up. I mean, that, that'll be something I can definitely appreciate on a second and probably third and fourth viewing. But this movie does play with time a lot yes. because it's kind of flat. You know, we, we're we in the present and then we flash back to, and it all went wrong when I made some horrible decisions. And right. then when we finally catch up. We catch up in a spectacular fashion where Hyde finally goes off by himself and not as, uh, sorry, uh, Jekyll goes off as himself to commit murders because 
at this point now I'm jumping forward here. He needs to keep Hyde at bay, but right. he still needs to finish his research, which means he needs this gland or whatever he's getting from these prostitutes that he's murdering. Right. Uh, so when we catch up with him in real time, he's stabbing the blonde prostitute from the beginning. And right. it's like this triple whammy of like just playing the death three times and the blood splatter gets more intense and the shrieking gets more intense. It's horrifying in a way that it wasn't at the beginning of the film when we're beginning the flashback. Um, but so anyway, when, okay, so Burke and Hare are, let's say out of the picture for different yeah. reasons. Yep. Uh, he just, he gets this elixir and he takes it, unleashes you know, Hyde, who he tells his upstairs kind of nosy neighbors is his sister and they're never kind of seen together. Um, we see the sort of Norman Bates kind of thing of like walking in the window at night mm -hmm. and you know shadowy figures and all that. But Hyde, you know, is the id and begins uh, doing things that Dr. Jekyll is sort of reluctant to do um, and and also helps him to get away with the research that he needs to do, a, a killing prostitutes, because as word gets out of this Jack the Ripper-esque character, they're like, they're, we're looking for someone in a cloak and a tall hat. So Jekyll burns his cloak and his tall hat, but then Hyde comes in handy because she can go out in a you know a red dress and a dark jacket and no one's going to suspect. In fact, they say that some of the prostitutes come out of a bar like, oh, it's just a lady leering at me from the shadows across the streets. <laughs> <laughs> well, and 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 um, and yes, it is and, and much like the novel and the first, you know, uh, film versions it deals a lot with human sexuality. Like, you know, uh, Jekyll is not, he's a pretty chaste guy. Uh, and whereas Hyde is very like lustful and, you know, she enjoys uh, both toying with men and enjoying men. Uh, and, and, and it's fun to kind of like see it played from that standpoint. Like there's a, there's almost an, a female empowerment quality where it's like, Yes, she has a, you know, a healthy sexual appetite, you know. Right. And and also the idea of uh, not being perceived as as a threat, as being the, right. the weaker sex, you know, as as I mentioned, you know, even the even the women of the town say, you know, because there's a talk of this killer out in the loose, like, well, it's not going to be any danger of uh, a woman attacking. And right. even when she goes off with uh, with Hyde. Uh, the one makes a remark like, oh, well, if this killer is out there, you don't think they do two at a time, do you? <laughs> right, right. Well, um, what's, what's interesting is, OK, so you got the the you, you alluded to um, the murders are in service of him acquiring these female hormones is how it's described. He's acquiring female hormones from his uh, from his victims. And they're so kind of I mean, it in my mind, I was like, okay, so he's getting like the pituitary gland or something like that. But they were being so cagey about it. Like they didn't say pituitary gland. They said, you know, they were, they were so like, well, he's already got what he was looking for, you know? And it's like, wait, was it, was it something a little more graphic, a little perhaps uh, further South than the pituitary gland? And because they, again, I, I only noticed at this time, how kind of they do not mention what is actually being taken right and they do the the murders themselves happen but then the kind of the digging around the right right street surgery is yeah. very much done from the point of view like we see ralph bates like doing something off screen down below so we never get yeah. a sense of what he's doing but there are a couple of the bodies under sheets yeah. where you see like a red stain that seems to be up. Yeah. You know, I don't know if it's the neck or the chest or somewhere, but I, I think it's, he's just got to find where the cooties gland is. And <laughs> that's, that's right, what he's that's trying right. to extract. extract. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, it's, I think the, one of the great things about this film are the, uh, the performances, yes. you know, all around. I mean, I think Ralph Bates, I've been a fan of his since we started, you know, talking about him in like these kind of Dracula movies and, and, and playing a, a villain, but it's great to see him here playing a reluctant guy who's going crazy and he's at the mercy of this other personality uh, who really doesn't like him very much. So this mm. uh, Martine Beswick, uh, she's wonderful too. In fact, during that first transformation scene, I had to go back oh, and rewatch this uh, twice because yeah. I still couldn't quite figure out where the cut was. Um, we see him... Uh, 
you know, kind of getting taken over by the effects of this drug that he's taken. Mm -hmm. And he is kind of, um, if I have this correct, he's like kind of whirling around. He ends up sitting down in a chair and then looking up at himself in a mirror. And when he looks up, it's Martine Beswick. Now, yeah. I did notice that the face, when he looks up, is very much, there's just one expression as if it's like a life cast mask of hers or like mm -hmm. something that like they did at the end of Sleepaway Camp for, mm -hmm. for Angela. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about what, how did they pull that off? Was it a mask? Was it like a, a trick edit that I just could not see? It, it is all in camera. So there are no cuts. My, what I believe happened based on what I was hearing from the commentary is that uh, it is, it's a fake mirror. Like it's, it's her coming in from a, like, there's a set on the opposite side and she's coming into the frame and they're kind of just mirror, literally mirror, mirroring each other, her sitting in her chair, him sitting in his chair. Wow. And they look up at each other and then they stand up. But, uh, but I think that's how that effect was accomplished. That is incredible. I mean, I was thinking that be because when I went back and, re and rewound it, I saw that from the angle, you see Ralph Bates kind of in the corner of the frame. Right. So I thought maybe someone was like slipping the mask up to him from off camera. And he was like kind of putting it on be between yeah. his hands and then looking up. It's, but uh, yeah, it's either that or there's Ralph Bates. I can't I, I can't remember, but I, I, it's either Ralph Bates. Like we see him in and then it cuts to not cuts, but like Martine is the one who throws herself into the chair. So it's like, we have that transition where yeah. she's the one who ends up in the chair looking at herself in the mirror. Um, so those are the, those are the two solutions I've came up with. They, they were not any help on the commentary, except to say that it was all in one, it was all in one shot. And that he's kind of like, and nobody even thinks about it. Like if you're telling the story, they're not thinking about, Oh, how they do that. You're thinking, oh, he just transformed into her. Well, you know, that might be his perspective. But for me as an audience member, it took me out of the movie in the best possible way. Because yeah, like, wow. I'm looking at this, I'm like, Magic this is 1971. Trip. This is not like today you could do it in, you know, an afternoon with CGI and, and all that yeah. other stuff. But I'm watching that like, how am I seeing what I'm seeing? Because I don't believe my eyes. I feel like I just watched some a man transform into a woman. And they do a few of these effects throughout the film i think this was the most effective one yeah yeah but later on particularly in the last transformation sequence where he's hanging from the ledge and his face is kind of pressed against this uh stained glass uh, fractured stained glass window yeah. and you see the kind of the the Bre the beswick baits uh moving in and out uh of the reflection it's all really cool looking mm -hmm. And I was, you know, I'm jumping far ahead here and, and way into spoilers. You know, Jekyll and Hyde die at the end of this. They kind of plunge to their death, at, you know, Jack Nicholson style on the street. Um, and then when they turn the body over, the face is like half man, half woman. Yeah. I was like, I didn't need that because the no. makeup job isn't that great. <laughs> I agree. I agree. That's, yeah, that was why I was like, oh, that's right. I've forgotten that that's, that's how that works. Um, they did, uh, I mean... On the one hand, it's a it's a gutsy choice. On the other hand, it's kind of like, eh, it's too bad it, it too bad it doesn't really work. Well, and I was expecting, and I I think my ending would have worked better. Um, but <laughs> the the mob in the street is watching the police pursue Dr. Jekyll on the rooftops. It's another great hammer rooftop pursuit. Yeah, very, very curse of the werewolf. Right. And what I loved is that. I'm sitting there like I know Jekyll has done some horrible things, but I also know that he's doing his best to keep the monster at bay and, you know, elude the cops and all this other stuff. He's he's a truly tragic figure. And when he's hanging on to the ledge, let me just kind of sidetrack here and say I watched Adventures in Babysitting earlier this week. Okay. And there's the bit where the girl is hanging from the uh, the crane's business tower, the, the, the diamond building in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, and you can tell it's all like rear projection and stuff it looks totally fake the key i think and this really came into focus watching dr jekyll and sister hyde i know that ralph bates is not hanging from you know a london apartment building by his fingernails but the way that it's shot mostly in close-ups from different angles which are also very much in close-up with a couple of establishing shots to say cops are over here he's walking and kind of slips out onto this ledge 
That's how you sell it. I was on the edge of my seat wondering if he was going to escape and there was going to be a further pursuit or if he was going to fall. Right. And that's it was really exciting. What I think was the mob knew that it was a man who was being pursued by the cops. So I think if he had fallen, even with that wonderful, horrible, blood, truly blood curdling woman's scream on the way down, mm -hmm. and then they pull the body back and it's Martin Beswick, the yeah. entire crowd would have been like, what the Wait. we just that was yeah. a man 10 seconds ago. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, and Martin, I mean, you, you talk about Ralph Bates's performance, which I mean, he really is, you know, he, he does the, the heavy lifting in this one. Uh, but I, he, he, uh, he really does a nice job of kind of playing a tragic character, but also there's like this kind of villainous undercurrent in that similar to Cushing's Dr. Frankenstein in that we get the amorality. You know, like he really is, he's not, he's not too broken up about, you know, people have to die. He's kind of like, I need somebody to justify this for me because, and which is interesting because, you know, like you say, his, his goal is to save humanity, but he's like, yeah, you know, you got to break a few eggs as well. Well, he loses his own humanity in the pursuit of saving everyone else, yeah. which is the great irony of it. Yeah. I, I have, I have a hard time thinking of him as a villain he's more of i just think susan was a few days too early into his life um <laughs> or maybe a few months uh because i think she would have been a positive influence and in, even though she did see him in the wrong direction with that whole boat analogy thing yeah. he just did seem like a guy who was so wrapped up in his work he forgot what it's you know that being a person is about being among people and you know love yeah. and relationships and and laughter Yep, if he'd uh, just shown up a couple, like a couple weeks earlier, before he got that whole crazy idea into his head, yeah, it's it's like it's yeah, sad. life's short, but you know, you're you're hanging out with the right people. Um, and then we got Martin Beswick. Yes, you're you're starting to say I was, because uh, she had done. She's she's one of the very few uh, female actresses to appear in two count them two Bond movies. She's in Doctor No. And she's also in Thunderball. Uh, and she had done Thunderball after she had done the... Uh, no, is that right? When was Thunderball? I don't know. I haven't seen either of them. I think Thunderball... I think, actually, because One Million Years B.C. came out in 66, I believe. And I believe that was the same year that Thunderball came out. Uh, but anyway, so she had been in the Hammer Fold before. And it was nice to have her back because... Uh, I think the casting of her and Ralph Bates, they both have that, you know, very uh, distinct black hair. And I, I, it's so funny because every time I watch Ralph Bates, he's got that just incredible mop of hair. And I was like, was that ever in style? Like, was that ever a thing that like anybody aspired to, to just have like this long, lanky, you know, shoulder length hair. And it, I mean, like it's parted. It's just like, I don't know. That's, I don't know that I've ever seen anybody else other than Ralph Bates trying to carry that look off. Prince Valiant from the comic strips. No, um, not even that was a bowl cut. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think he, I, I think he works it. Um, it was, it's before I even had watched this movie or knew what it was. I put together the thumbnail for this episode and I saw mm. a, an image of the two of them kind of like that whole, like, half of it's Ralph Bates and the other half is Martin Beswick. And yeah. when I first saw it, I thought it was Ralph Bates sort of in drag. Right. But they they did such great casting, not only in terms of performance, but finding the female version of Ralph Bates. It's not completely different, but it's not completely recognizable either. Well, and I love I love those little flashes of seeing Ralph Bates in the red dress. You know, like where you're, where, you know, like when he's killing his, his, uh, her victims, like it flashes back and forth and you kind of, you get all these and Ralph Bates, I guess, had said at some point that like, that would have been really daring for him to have been discovered in a, in a red dress, you know, like we never see him in full woman's dress. Whereas, uh, the sister Hyde character, we see her, you know, decked out in, in female clothes but we also see her in kind of some mannish attire as well. Yeah. I mean, there, as, as you kind of mentioned, there was one of the later kills 
um, we do see Ralph Bates and it's very quick cutting. So we see yeah. him kind of it's it's almost like a montage of all of his all yes. of the killings that alternate between Martin Beswick and uh, Ralph Bates. And we do see him in like a like a dress or something. I think it was like a white dress, but it's yeah. for just an instant. Um, and that's, you know, this movie gets really wild uh, towards the end in terms of the the editing. And, you know, it's one of the great uh capturings uh, capturings representations of a descent into madness mm -hmm. because even the opening song was the, the opening you know theme song there's like this candle burning on a on a red curtain which i believe is actually supposed to be the the material that the dress comes was made dress, out of. yeah right um it's like this almost like a romantic big you know kind of a gone with the wind style score i'm like what is this this isn't the beginning of a horror movie that mm -hmm. score evolves over time so that by the end it's completely turned into this nightmare tune that matches yeah. the nightmarish visions that we're watching and again I, I love this film i just don't think i can convince anybody to watch it who's not already <laughs> on the hammer well yeah not not based on that title uh, because it does it does sound like a big cheesy title you know i mean there was there was dr jekyll and ms hyde with sean young and timothy daly i believe from the 80s or 90s um but they had I, as i said earlier they had done the dr jekyll story earlier and it was the two faces of dr jekyll and the difference was that uh dr jekyll had a beard and was you know very kind of like studious and when he turned into Mr. Hyde, he became actually handsome. You know, he was clean shaven. And so it was kind of a flip of what we had been used to seeing with the Hyde character, the Hyde character being kind of like a, a bestial version of the good doctor. And it went the opposite direction. It went, you know, like this is, per, it was still kind of based in sexuality in that we have a, a, a man of, you know, man of intellect turning into a man of, uh, not necessarily baser pleasures, but certainly uh, enjoying the earthly pleasures. Well, it reminds me, my only exposure really to Jekyll and Hyde was before this was Alan Moore's The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, not mm. the film. That film was garbage, but the comics, <laughs> it showed, you know, just kind of a regular person. But then the Hyde character uh, was this almost looked like the Incredible Hulk mixed with the scarred version of Two-Face mm -hmm. uh, from the Batman comics. Um, let me ask you this. Because you mentioned Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I'm just trying to think if anyone has done a mo like an actual modern interpretation of it, because with the way we're we're going in, in Hollywood with like gender swaps and things like that, I mm -hmm. think it'd be a really interesting play because you could have Dr. Jekyll. Dr. Jekyll could be a woman. Sure could. And Mr. Hyde, you know, flip this movie around where it's the, the female main you know, scientist becomes this, you know, uh, seductive man you know I, mm -hmm. has that been done before i do not recall anything like that so that would be interesting what's funny about the two faces of dr jekyll is that i remember thinking well that's dumb like you can't like lose your beard and then grow your beard back and like but on the other side it's like well it totally it makes total sense for somebody to like turn into a werewolf you know <laughs> <laughs> like you can of course you can get hairier you just can't get you know clean shaven that's ridiculous I, you know, I, on the other hand, I do understand that conundrum. Like, oh, that yeah. doesn't make I mean, any sense. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like, no, it actually, it's the same not sense that the other one makes. Mm. Um, um, and I do want to mention really quick, our, our actor uh, who plays um, Susan's supercilious brother, Howard. Howard, yes. Who, who later falls for uh, uh, Ms. Hyde. Uh, he's played by Louis Fiander, and I had not... Uh, I didn't. I didn't recognize him. And I thought. I thought he might be another actor um, that I'd seen in another Hammer film. So I was looking up his filmography, and it turns out he is the lead in the 1975 Spanish film "Who Can Kill a Child," which is a fantastic. You know, it is what you think it is. In that he he and his wife are on an island where the kids have gone nuts and they've murdered all the adults. It's like children and of the corn. It's like children of the corn. And I was like, wait, what? That's him. Um, and as I looked up the picture, like he has a mustache in who can kill a child. Uh, but he is not the same 
character at all. Like he's a very different character than what we're seeing here, where it's kind of, you know, smug and, you know, upper class twit. And uh, I was like, whoa, I need to see who can kill a child again, because I don't, I wouldn't have even thought that that was the same actor. Well, maybe we can mark that down for next year because that sounds really interesting. Oh um, no, you should you should see Who Could Kill a Child. It's it's not the feel good movie of the year, but it's really really good. Well, I, I do like uh, I did like the Howard character. In fact, I like the the dynamic here of that that whole family. You've got the mom mm -hmm. who's just kind of she's always playing solitaire or knitting, and she just kind of wants the kids out of the house. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and Howard is you know, he looks kind of like the, the, like he's might be up to no good, you know, kind of the nice guy who's going to turn out to be sort of a problem, but no, he, I think he's just a nice dude and, and suspicious of what's going on downstairs and protective of his sister. Um, he doesn't get like the big kind of heroic, uh, ending or anything like that, no. but I, I kind of appreciate that about this movie. There's so much unexpectedness about how this whole thing turns out that, yeah, I, I can't recommend this movie enough. Well, you reminded me of Barry Andrews from uh, who's the male lead in um, or the male ingenue in uh, Dracula's Risen from the Grave. And also uh, he's in Blood on Satan's Claw, which is uh, made by Tygon, which is a kind of a competitor of Hammer. But I was like, is that Barry Andrews? No, it's not Barry Andrews. Who is this guy? And that's when I, I was like, oh, yeah. But I, I, I also I really enjoy Howard. I think he's kind of he's just funny in that he's he's very kind of like surface level um and yes i mean i feel like he does have some sensitivity he notices when um you know like he's he's teased his dear sister a little too much and he backs off a little but i also just love how he's just such a like oh my god it's a girl i'm gonna because <laughs> he walks in i mean and and this is one of those cases tell me what you thought of this where i feel like the nudity is yes it's there for exploitation purposes but it feels really grounded in the story like here is a man who is like oh my gosh uh i have transformed and martin beswick on the commentary she's like it's it's he's been reborn as a woman and he's like kind of discovering himself and the sensuality that is you know a woman i come from a a slightly different approach and this isn't something I arrived at, you know, I've only seen this movie once. Sure. So when I, when she first appears and she's kind of like looking at her naked body and kind of running her hands all over herself, that's, I did think that I was like, oh, this is a guy who just woke up in a woman's body. Mm -hmm. But given the, the way that she talks about Jekyll um, and the way that she kind of interacts with other people who are like, oh, is, is Jekyll here? And she's kind of like, who are you talking? Like right, right. the, the personalities are barely aware of each other. Right. So I kind of took this to be as this is not a man waking up in a woman's body. It's a woman waking up in a woman's body for the first being time. Yes, kind yes, of like yes. as as a 20 something. Yeah, you literally know. being born. Right. Yeah. I think that's that's equally fascinating. And yeah, I agree. It's she is, you know, not sore and sore on the eyes, um, but the, there were way more opportunities for exploitation in this film. And I think comparatively, it's it's a rather chaste. I mean, most of this film involves uh, the, the plot centers around prostitutes in London being killed. Right. Um, and I think a lesser movie, you would have seen a lot more of these people before they got you know cut up. Uh, I will say so the, the surprise is in the third act in terms of the violence kind of getting ramped up. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I appreciated that and I wasn't expecting it yeah. because you'll see like, a blood splatter across a wanted poster, which is a nice effect. But then we get into especially that montage, like, wow, they are really going for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. And I mean, even though like, you know, the, like this, the arterial spray that hits the, the poster, you know, it feels a bit like somebody's off camera with a little syringe, but I, I didn't mind it. And I, as you said, like when we see it three times in a row, it's like, there's, there's some kind of like dramatic heft to it. I, I enjoyed that quite a bit. Um, and I also want, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I, I also liked that the wanted posters are almost another character in this movie, yeah. like specifically the, the scene that uh, compels 
Jekyll to burn his clothes. He literally is coming out of a shop after someone has put up this poster fresh on the wall and he's yeah. standing there looking at it. Wanted man with a tall black hat and a black cape. Yep, and he's, he's looking like, at it and he kind of looks looks around like, hmm. <laughs> whoops. <laughs> Hope no one's looking at me right now. <laughs> right. Although I was kind of like, that's your that's your description. That narrows it right down. <laughs> <laughs> it's true um but what were you gonna say i was gonna say that there, there there is a moment that does feel pretty straight up exploitation and that's when uh martin beswick drops the dressing gown to pull down the curtains you know and i was kind of like okay that wasn't necessary <laughs> i mean no, I, I disagree it, no. <laughs> <laughs> no i mean it's like yeah i mean it's i i don't mind but again i mean Whereas the one feels very kind of grounded in the drama, but the other one feels like, okay, here's a pretty girl going to take her clothes off and change into something else. Well, on this, on that subject, um, we do get these kind of mid transformation sequences, particularly early on when he's uh, figuring out how much he can take before the, you know, the Hyde personality takes over. So mm. you'll see something like where he's turned into Hyde. And then she'll be interacting with someone and all of a sudden notice that her hand is transformed from yeah. Martine Beswick's into Ralph Bates or, you know, second unit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we haven't even talked about ADs. that. I mean, the fact that like he, we have so many kind of like that's kind of like the big tell is like whose hand is transforming one or the other. Well, but to the to the point about the one of the seductions and uh, the kind of the removal of clothes, I believe it's when she's with um the Robinson. professor before she kills yeah. him uh she takes off her her gown but she leaves kind of her undergarments yep. and in that moment again i thought it was a trick of the eye because the one her arm it would have been her left arm you could see like the the veins and the tone in it it looked like a more masculine arm than belonged on her feminine body uh, that we'd seen before. And I don't know if she had specifically like worked out a lot just for this scene or something <laughs> to get ripped for, to, to show off that arm or whatever, but it looked almost like, I think it served the story, but it looked like an illusion. Yeah. Well, and also when she's, uh, when she's playing to kill Susan out in the street and Ralph, Ralph Bates is uh, Dr. Jekyll's hand shows up and stops her from doing it. Uh, I thought that was a, a now kind of going back to the Professor Robertson murder. Uh, I I I watched it twice because it's one of the rare times that when somebody is like it's the lovers embrace and you know they stab the the knife in from behind. It's one of the rare times where it went in very slowly and deliberately, and you kind of saw it dawning on Robertson's face, like oh I'm being stabbed. Whereas usually it's like, you know, it's a quick stab in the back and they go, oh my God. Um, but I thought that was really effective. I was like, oh, wow, that looks, that looks really gruesome. And like, why, you know, like what was the reasoning behind choosing to do it at that pace? You know, here's where you could break into all different kinds of layers. But, you know, I'm wondering if there was a part of Hyde mm. that was actually Jekyll who tolerated professor robertson but didn't quite appreciate his kind of hound dogged you know di disrespect you know womanizing that we see in the beginning of the picture right. so there might have been a portion of that that had maybe bled into the psychology of hyde who's like you know here's this is what you think of women here's uh we're gonna give it a little bit back to you it's it's a slow yeah. you know unpleasant penetration <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that, that doesn't really, I mean, because it was, it was so distinctively different than anything else, any other murder in the film. You know, yeah. All the other murders are stab, whereas this one was just like a slow, like, you know, just grinding it into his back. I was like, oh man, that just looks terrible. Well, it's one of the few, like really personal, you know, attacks in the film. Well, it's also right? the only man that she kills or that he kills. Wow, it's the only it's the only yeah. male that's murdered in the film, aside from uh, aside Burke. from Burke, yeah. <laughs> Who? Wow, I mean, yeah, that's what I loved is you know establishing that character when they're in the in the pub and the waitress comes over and uh, he's kind of propositioning her 
And then she shows up on the slab like the next scene as like, yeah. the only problem I had with that is that I think that waitress looked it was too early on in the movie. It looked a little bit like Susan, like mm -hmm. maybe that was her, you know, she, she tended bar nights or something like <laughs> they wouldn't kill her. And they didn't. <laughs> they didn't. You're, you're but uh, anything uh, to wrap up Dr. Jekyll and Sister Hyde, any final well, thoughts? Um, I mean, we, we aren't going to get to it this uh, this year, at least. Um, but uh, Hammer did try another stab at the uh, Ripper uh, mythos with Hands of the Ripper. And I think that one's actually also pretty worthwhile. Uh, we're not going to watch it in December, but it was in the running for uh, for a, a candidacy this year. Uh, but it's it's another worthwhile one. So it's like, again, I think this is the most successful of both the Jack the Ripper and the uh, Dr. Jekyll stories. And I give credit to Brian Clemens. Uh, we will see more from him next month because he wrote and directed Captain Kronos Vampire Hunter, which is right, another well kind of like fun, cheeky uh, twist on what we had seen before coming from Hammer. Well, that's a great transition because I was going to ask about next month. And I actually wrote it down on a post at this time. <laughs> um, I know that's one of the rules of the Internet. Never ha never hold up a blank piece of paper because it leaves you susceptible to memes. But I don't care. <laughs> um, so you mentioned Captain Kronos Vampire Hunter from 1974. But also, but also according to the original schedule, we have yeah. Vampire Circus from 72. Are we going to end the year on a double feature? That was the plan, although I know when we proposed a double feature for Academia Giallo and you nearly lost your mind. So I, I hope that we can still do our double feature because I think both of these films are deserving of, of attention, especially in this kind of like, not necessarily second tier, but rather alternative quality. Like instead of Hammer and, and instead of Hammer, Frankenstein's and Dracula's, this whole theme of this year was kind of the other hammers that also are deserving of your attention. And I feel like both of those fit the bill. All right. Well then we will do it. I think my apprehension with Academia Giallo is uh, there was a part of me that was like, wait, this is, that would be the second double feature for December. I can't <laughs> handle that. So yeah, I, I was going to ask you, I did ask you, I really going to do two next month. And the answer is yes. You sold I'd me. I'd love to do two. So yeah, join us back next month for uh, uh not not gonna be as yell the the finale of uh Son of Hammerland. I say the finale because we've got to come up with another theme for next year involving Hammerland, but it's not gonna be Sun because we we just did Sun. We just um, did Sun. But uh, yeah, so Captain Kronos, Vampire Hunter, and Vampire Circus next month. You have been Aaron Christensen uh, of Horror One Hundred and One with Doctor AC. Check out the links below. For, uh, for all of his stuff, all of your stuff. I, I don't know who I'm addressing here. Uh, you out there watching this or listening to it, um, if you like this content, please feel free to like and subscribe and join us back here next month for the big 2022 finale. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this journey as much as I have. I have I was a little skeptical about Son of Hammerland at the outset. I'm like, mm. are there really going to be that many movies that are as good as the ones we spent last year talking about? And the answer is a resounding yes. It's been, it's been a great 14 ride. of them. It's that's crazy. It is crazy. But thanks, AC. Um, we'll catch you next month. I'm I'm very excited. See you next month, where the sun of Hammerland will set. That was perfect. Thanks. And I'm embarrassed I didn't think of it. <laughs>